for 40 years, as is indicated in this, which is in, available for you in the back, Lyndon LaRouche campaigned for a new international economic order. And over the course of that 40-year period, particularly the last 25 years, last quarter century, that campaign took a very specific road after the fall of the Berlin Wall. A set of policies were initiated, advanced, developed, promoted tirelessly, particularly in Europe and particularly in Asia. The keynote speaker and founder of the Schiller Institute was the center of, the heart of, the spark plug of, the guidon of, the banner of that policy. Not only could that policy not have occurred without her, and specific at the time that that initiative was upgraded, Lyndon LaRouche was incarcerated, incarcerated unjustly in a prison in the United States, largely for what you've just heard him describe in the audio tape we just played. One of the confusions that has existed continually among Americans in discussion about the policies of Russia and China in particular is that these are somehow foreign policies and that the United States is being asked to join up with the foreigners, when in fact the policy that Russia and China in specific and the BRICS nations as a whole have adopted is a policy, policy that was born in, nurtured in, developed in, and then extended from the United States and a particular and unique collaboration between two individuals, Lyndon LaRouche and our keynote speaker. This is important because the concept of America and the concept of being an American is not a geographic one. It's not the piece of dirt called the United States, though many of us may love that piece of dirt. And it's not a bad thing to love the United States, but that's not what an American is. The idea of the United States and the idea of America is a principle. It's an immortal principle. Yes, it is, in fact, made immortal in the form of the preamble to the Constitution, but it's only kept immortal by the actions of individuals. Our keynote speaker exemplifies the American principle at its highest level. Because at its highest level, the American principle is the most important expression of humanist, platonic, advanced scientific culture ever devised. And it's important that we not allow any of those terms that I just mentioned to be dragged in the dirt by people that don't understand them. Being a human being and aspiring to be the most that humanity can be requires a sense of art as well as a sense of necessity. And in the founding of the Schiller Institute, in the basing of the American initiative for economic justice and development in the bosom of poetry, our founding speaker added an essential element that was missing in the United States, which has allowed us to impel a process worldwide that no one else could have accomplished. So it's always my honor, and particularly today, at this time of the President's Day holiday, this is a person we would be running for president except for technical reasons. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Helga LaRouche. Thank you. Thank you for your nice welcome and these very sweet words of you. It is a particular well, pleasure to be in New York because my last 
speech, I concluded here by saying, I talk to you as a New Yorker. <laughs> Very few people know that I used to live here for several years. <clears throat> and um, you know, naturally, this was a reference to the famous speech by Kennedy in Berlin. Well, I, I think we are right now confronted with an unbelievable situation. <clears throat> uh, we are still <clears throat> extremely close to World War III. I mean, this danger has been alleviated a tiny little bit three days ago <clears throat> when you had the intervention by uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Merkel, Ms. President Hollande, uh, Putin and Poroshenko at their meeting in Minsk. Uh, and an agreement was uh, reached, the so-called Minsk II agreement. But I, uh, I hate to tell you, this is a very, very short and potentially very, very fragile breathing space of maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks. And the reality is we are still absolutely on the eve, on the, on the two minutes or two seconds before World War III. And that has been generally understood now in Europe, I think much, much more than in the United States, uh, and we are still also at the verge of a potential complete blowout of the financial system, and that is the reason why we are in this war danger, because the war danger is not just Ukraine and the danger that that war could go out of control. The war danger comes from the fact that the <clears throat> empire, that which has developed, that which has developed since the end of the Soviet Union, as a system of globalization is about to blow out in a much, much bigger way than we had it with Lehman Brothers and AIG in 2008. But let me quickly go uh, into where we stand <clears throat> strategically. Now, this agreement, the so-called Minsk II agreement, um, is a 10-point agreement. Um, it uh, includes a ceasefire which is supposed to start tonight at midnight. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, it's supposed to pull back the artillery and other heavy weapon systems into a, a minimum 10 kilometer safe zone. It's supposed to reestablish the demarcation line, which was established already in the Minsk I agreement uh, in September. Uh, and does not include the territorial gains of the rebels uh, in the fighting since. Uh, it is supposed to be supervised by an OSCE uh, team. It is supposed to include an amnesty for many, if not, not, not all, but, but many, of the <coughs> uh, prisoners of war, also a prisoner of war exchange. Uh, Kiev, the government, is supposed to restore the wages, pensions, and the banking system in East Ukraine, and it will give special status of autonomy to Donetsk and uh, Lugansk, and <clears throat> basically all foreign fighters are supposed to, put, uh, to be pulled out. Uh, <clears throat> it is also expressed by the four leaders, Merkel, Hollande, uh, Putin, and Poroshenko, that you know, the chance that this agreement would last would be greatly enhanced uh, if there would be a better cooperation between the EU, uh, Ukraine, and, and Russia. Now, <clears throat> it is extremely fragile. Why am I saying this? Because it is now, you know, that the, um, what I used to call the Ibicus principle, uh, the, the, you know, the nemesis, the nemesis of the evil deed could haunt the people who tried this agreement, because it was the despicable refusal of Merkel in particular, being the head of the German government, uh, who 70 years after the end of World War II and the end of the 12-year Nazi regime in Germany, uh, did not uh, admit that the crisis in Ukraine had been caused by <clears throat> a Nazi coup which brought into the government not just neo-Nazis, but real Nazis, going back all the way to Stepan Pandera and that organization which had helped 
the Nazi occupation of Ukraine in the 40s. And these were networks which were kept all the way uh, in the post-war period by the CIA, by British MI6 and the German uh, Galen organization of the BND. They were kept sort of like the Gladio operation of NATO as a stay behind in the case of a confrontation with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now, these were good Nazis <laughs> because they were owned by the West. Uh, but then, you know, in the evolution of the Maidan, they made a coup on the 21st of February. And that was not recognized by Germany, France, the United States, the British, the EU. They all went along with it and they all pretended that this Ukrainian government uh, <coughs> had been a legitimate government uh, and that, you know, basically it was okay to work with them. Now, it happens to be the fact that after the Minsk II agreement was just announced, immediately uh, Dimitri Yarosh, the head of the right sector, and other uh, members of these Nazi groupings, which are in the National Guard uh, <clears throat> and several battalions, uh, independent battalions in the Ukraine militia, they announced they will not endorse the Minsk II agreement, they will keep fighting. Now, these people have the ability to wreck that fragile Minsk II agreement because, you know, they are Nazis and they are, <laughs> they are well equipped and they are being better equipped by the United States right now. Because as the Minsk agreement was being negotiated, uh, the Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who is the head of the U.S. Army uh, in uh, Europe announced that he will continue with the arming of these people, with the training of them, uh, obviously for the war uh, against the uh, uh, rebels in the east and potentially uh, beyond that. Now, this is, this is a situation which must stop because if this is not ended, if these Nazis are not disarmed, and if those people who are backing them are not uh, you know, <clears throat> blamed and, and, and put, you know, to responsibility, this has the potential of blowing up immediately into World War III. Now, that means Victoria Nuland, who is the uh, Secretary of State uh, in, the, in the State Department and in charge of European affairs, who has been all along the backer, not only of these Nazi networks, but also of, uh, you know, what she calls Yats, uh, the so-called uh, minister-president of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and you all remember this famous discussion she had uh, on the phone, which was then taped with the U.S. ambassador in Kiev, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, in which she said these famous words, um, F the EU, uh, by meaning, you know, that uh, they wanted to get, go ahead and put in their property uh, Yatsenyuk uh, at the disadvantage of the German project uh, Kli uh, Vladimir Klitschko, um, and, uh, you know, which everybody was shocked and it made a big spectacle about that she used such vulgar language, while the real scandal was she was caught red-handed uh, in interfering into the internal affairs of a sovereign country by imposing uh, <coughs> this, uh, this uh, Yatsenyuk, whom she calls Yats, uh, who is the one who is backing all these people from the right sector uh, and other Bandera networks. So you have something which <coughs> potentially can become the tragedy of extinction of mankind if this is not cleaned up. So we have published a big dossier about that, which I want you to uh, access and to read and, you know, really uh, help us to, you know, get the Congress to investigate this because this is right now the Achilles heel of the whole uh, <coughs> further existence of civilization. Now, I just returned from a two-week trip uh, to Germany and also Denmark, where I had a series of uh, <clears throat> events uh, to, you know, do essentially what we are doing here, to try to mobilize more people to the reality of the strategic situation. 
And I can tell you, I, what I'm saying now is not some reading of some reports or so, but I can tell you firsthand from many discussions I had with people uh, in Germany, but also p other people, East and Western people, uh, and <coughs> also uh, in, in, in Copenhagen, that what caused Merkel and Hollande to all of a sudden develop this hectic diplomacy Because this came practically out of the blue. Uh, all of a sudden, Merkel uh, and Hollande went to Kiev. Uh, they met with uh, Poroshenko. They met with uh, Yats. Then they went to Moscow. They met for several long hours with Putin. Then Mrs. Merkel came back. She, she rushed to uh, Washington, talking with Obama, running back uh, to Germany, attending some other European Union functions, and then attending on Wednesday this Minsk uh, meeting in, in uh, Belarus. Now, I can assure you that what caused this sudden eruption of, uh, you know, also from the best I can tell you, uncoordinated, uncoordinated diplomacy, uncoordin not coordinated with Washington, Uh, it was the clear perception that the world was about to blow up. Because at that point, uh, the news that the Americans were about to send lethal defensive weapons, whatever that is supposed to, to be, you know, <laughs> uh, into Ukraine, uh, and that there was a perception that that would lead to an immediate provocation of Russia, because by arming these uh, unholy Uh, elements in Ukraine uh, with heavy American weapons meant de facto a NATO US intervention into Ukraine and given the extreme uh, tenseness of the situation, uh, the heavy brutal war fighting going on in eastern Ukraine, uh, Ukraine uh, meant that the Europeans thought if this happens then you know, the Russians will react And then you go into a big war over Ukraine, and that will be a big war, not only Ukraine, but in all of Europe. And by the very nature of it, it will be a global thermonuclear war. And that's why they developed this uh, extremely uh, hectic uh, <clears throat> activity. Spiegel Online had all of a sudden... You know, I mean, we have been, and some of you know that because you have been following what, what we have been saying and doing, uh, we have been warning that the uh, policies of NATO expansion to the east, the policy of global uh, prompt strike, first strike doctrine, global U.S. missile, uh, def uh, mis global missile defense system, all of that meant that we were extremely close to World War III, but nobody would talk about it. You know, this is one of the absolute scandals that, you know, you are about to go extinct and the politicians, because they are too coward, are not talking about it. But suddenly you had a whole eruption of articles, like Spiegel Online had an article in the same days where Mark Merkel was running around uh, <clears throat> basically saying the nuclear ghost is back. And it showed on the picture two warheads which were directed against, you know, whoever looked at that picture. So, you know, the idea that, you know, this is about to happen uh, was clearly mediated, quoting then uh, the American analyst uh, Theodore Postol, who basically had warned that the present stri first strike uh, mis is, uh, doctrine of the United States is a miscalculation uh, because it assumes that you can win a preemptive first nuclear strike and it referenced uh, many other uh, such things. Now, the, um, basically, uh, <coughs> the politicians uh, up to that point were what we call uh, in, in German, or there is an idiom saying, playing the ball very flat, which is you know, being low-key, not exposing yourself too much, just trying to get ahead. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is now changing. Uh, just today, there was another Spiegel on, uh, online article, and this is a complete change in profile, uh, basically saying that uh, uh, under the headline, the war next door, can Merkel's diplomacy save Europe, or will it lead to an out-of-control out war and even a nuclear war? 
So, I mean, this is, I can only assure you, this is unheard of. But still, you know, as compared to the immediacy of that danger, that we are at the verge, maybe minutes, maybe hours, maybe days away from the extinction of civilization. You know, we're not talking about some war. We are talking about if it comes to a nuclear war, uh, using the entire arsenal of uh, all the nuclear powers in the world, because it's the logic of nuclear war that that will happen, um, then nobody will be left. Mankind will be extinct. And the fact that that is not being discussed is something we have to absolutely change. Now, behind closed doors, a lot of people <clears throat> uh, admit that the situation right now is much more dangerous than during the height of the Cold War, and that includes the Cuban Missile Crisis, because at that point, even you know, when the Cuban Missile Crisis was at the absolute maximum, you had a private, secret communication between Khrushchev and Kennedy. Uh, this is now recently published that you know they, they, they communicated, and it has been acknowledged uh, in the recent period by several analysts and experts that that kind of code of behavior does not exist between Obama and Putin. They do not communicate. There are some telephones between the military, the Russian and the American military, but as some of these people who are very much involved in this told me personally, they do not know that what the military are talking is backed up by the political leadership. Uh, and that creates an area of absolute... Uh, <clears throat> absolute, um, uh, you know, extreme worry. Uh, but in France, in Germany, in Italy, in other countries, there is right now a behind-the-scenes discussion, which only comes up a little bit. Uh, should Europe uh, assert its own interest or go up in a nuclear war? And that is a new phenomenon. It's, it's, it's like that the entire foundation of you know, the post-war transatlantic alliance is crumbling. And when uh, Vice President Biden in, uh, <clears throat> in a recent uh, occasion, I think it was the Munich Security Conference, uh, almost you know, magically repeated, you know, there is no split in the alliance, uh, Merkel and I are on the same line, then that was a very meager attempt uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, you know, cover up uh, this situation. Now, um, it is interesting because the former chief of general staff of the Bundeswehr, of the German army, General Kuya, just a few days ago, two days ago, appeared in a, a very prominent talk show in the first channel German TV where he said, that you know the Ukraine uh, breathing space, which has been gained since you know, that was one day later, since since Wednesday, can only be solved uh, if the, the United States uh, you know ch changes their profile. That only if Obama would sit on the same table uh, with Putin, and that they would agree on both uh, you know the Ukraine solution. Uh, and uh, the general uh, change in the in the strategy uh, could there be uh, a calming down of the situation? The Ukraine has to be uh, has to agree because you know or it would affect the Ukraine because of the strong dependence of Ukraine on the United States because this Ukraine Kiev government is a U.S. sponsored government and uh, Russia because. Uh, only if Russia um, and Putin in particular has the feeling uh, that they are being recognized as a co-equal world power with the United States and not uh, in, a, in a, you know, a disrespectful way called a regional power, you know, like Obama recently did, which Kuyat said uh, is ridiculous. Any country which has ICBMs, nuclear uh, warheads on ICBMs, is not a regional power. Uh, so <clears throat> he said uh, also, you know, in order to set the record straight, that Russia never wanted to directly intervene in, uh, in Ukraine militarily, 
if they would have chosen to do so, the conflict would have been over in 48 hours. If they would have wanted to, they could have occupied Kiev in a matter of days. And uh, basically, he also pointed to the fact that despite the strong elements of the Nazi components in the militias and in the National Guard uh, in uh, Ukraine, that the Ukrainian army is in a completely desolate state uh, and it would take years uh, to get them to be an effective fighting force. So, uh, as I said, right now, uh, despite the Minsk agreement, uh, General, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges uh, said he will not slow down the proactive deployment of the U.S. military in the Ukraine and the NATO forward basing of headquarters in Poland uh, in session uh, and the um, transference of a battalion of 600 paratroopers from Vicenza in Italy of the 173rd Airborne Brigade uh, to train the Ukrainians there is also going forward. Now, to just repeat, you know, they intend to train the National Guard, the right sector, these Nazi groupings, uh, groupings which openly display swastikas and other Nazi symbols. So that is what we are dealing with, and I think we have to cause in the United States a real discussion that you know this is this is what the war danger uh, constitutes, and if it's supposed to be stopped, then uh, that has to be stopped. And these Nazis have to be disarmed. I don't care how they have to be disarmed by the U.S. troops by the OSZE, by the UN, I don't care how, but they have, to be, they have to be neutralized. And there will be no solution to the Ukrainian uh, potential trigger of World War III until that is done. So, as I said, the real reason uh, for the war danger is on the one side the fact that the transatlantic financial system, or what you call globalization, uh, the combination of Wall Street, the city of London, and associated institutions are about to blow uh, in a complete way, you know, where one too big to fail bank goes, the whole system will come down. And that is why it is absolutely uh, true that when Putin said that if it was not the Ukraine uh, to find a point of conflict, they would have found some other pretext for the confrontation. Uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Secretary of uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said the same thing. He said, the Ukraine is merely a pretext for a larger geopolitical goal. And that has also been just stated by nobody else but the former ambassador of the Reagan administration uh, in Russia, uh, Jack Matlock, who just gave a very, very important press conference uh, in, Mos in, in uh, Washington, uh, where he uh, said that he absolutely shares the assessment of Lavrov. Now, you have a situation uh, where we are hovering on the point of a collapse. Wall Street, uh, because of the investment in the oil, shale, and gas, uh, oil, sh uh, shale, gas, and oil investments, because of the collapse of the oil price, because of a complete bankruptcy of that system, where all these banks are 40 percent larger than in 2008, they are up to 85 percent more exposed to derivatives than that uh, at that time. Uh, so this is about to blow, and you heard from uh, Professor Katzenevas uh, that the European banking situation is not one iota better, and there, you know, we are now in an equally traumatic situation. Now, there is a huge change in Europe. Europe is no longer the same as it was a couple of weeks ago, exactly because of the election victory of Syriza and the independent Greeks. Uh, because what the, these two parties uh, make their election campaign with, they promised they would end the absolute brutal austerity policy of the Troika, a policy which in the last several years had cut the Greek industry by one third, uh, increased the death rate, the suicide rate, uh, <clears throat> and 
collapse the birth rate and led to a youth unemployment of 65%. Now, I mean, you can imagine what is the mood in a country where two-thirds of the young people are unemployed. So on that program that he would end the uh, policy of the Troika and cancel the memorandum, uh, basically Alex, uh, Alexis Tsipras won an overwhelming, not a total majority, but almost, but together with the independent Greeks, they have now a government which, according to the latest polls, enjoys 70% of the support uh, of the people. Now, um, so the unheard thing happened. They got elected, and after the election, they said, we stick to our election promise. <laughs> Now, that has never happened in recent history in any country of the West. Uh, for example, there was the um, famous example of the SPD politician in Germany, uh, Walter Müntefering, who said at some occasion, you know, it is so unfair to be reminded of your election promise you made a couple of months ago. <laughs> no, but these people, um, they, uh, they say we stick to it, we cancel the memorandum, and not only that, uh, we are not only talking for Greece, but we are planning to use that situation to change the entire failed policy of the euro for all of Europe. Now, that is uh, why they are so completely freaked out, and that is why, you know, right now, uh, Schäuble, Merkel, Hollande, even Hollande on that point, despite other lip service, Renzi from Italy, uh, the EZB, they are all in a complete hard line, and they say, we insist that the pound of flesh has to be uh, paid Now, the Greek must stick to the memorandum. There is no softening uh, of the situation. Now, this is headed for a clash uh, also. Today, there is a meeting of the so-called technical people supposed to uh, work out some discussion of how to, to do this. But <coughs> Tsipras just said, you know, let these technical people talk. That doesn't mean that Greece will be blackmailed. We are not blackmailing anybody, but we do not allow to be blackmailed either. Uh, and <coughs> basically, uh, we will stick to our guns. We will not uh, capitulate. Now, I remember that in 89, when shortly before the GDR came down, Uh, everybody knew already uh, East Germany was completely bankrupt. Um, they, they were really collapsing. They lost all authority. The people you know, wanted to travel abroad. They had these large Monday demonstrations. And then on the, I think it was the 8th or so of uh, October, there was the 40th anniversary of the DDR. And they had this huge military parade with tanks, with rockets and whatnot. And uh, Honecker uh, said... Socialism in its course will not be uh, interrupted by the ox or the donkey. Now that's a germ in, in German it rhymes. Den Sozialismus in seinem Lauf hält weder Ox noch Esel auf. Anyway, it means socialism will be here for 1,000 years. Twelve days later, Honecker was out. Three weeks later, the Berlin Wall had come down. And at that point, the people who were sticking to their line until the last moment were called the concrete heads, he heads made out of concrete, while those people who quickly changed their view were called the Wendehels, uh, the, the turn turncoat uh, uh, necks, because they could, some people in these days had, you know, <coughs> necks which were, <laughs> uh, you know, several times wound around. Anyway, so now we have these same concrete heads, Merkel, Schäuble, and they will probably have a similar uh, fate. Now, why is the euro finished? Because if the EZB makes a compromise and softens the conditions for Greece, then that will have a signal for all the other countries who suffer from similar austerity policies. Italy, Spain, uh, <clears throat> Portugal, Ireland, uh, but even France, you know, where people really hate the kind of German austerity policy, And, uh, you know, it would be a signal for them that they will also not allow the austerity. If, on the other side, they push Greece out of the euro, which could happen very quickly, 
Then, naturally, and you heard Professor Katzenevas talking, uh, then Greece may become by force the first country to join with the BRICS uh, to go for other sources of financing. They already have uh, asked for that uh, with Russia. Russia already said they would help them. Uh, Komenos, the foreign minister, uh, the defense minister, is, is right now in Moscow. Uh, pro the foreign minister, Kotsias, uh, was a professor in essence uh, for the BRICS. The BRICS is his specialty. He would teach courses in Chinese even. The Chinese have uh, bought into the port of Piraeus, and uh, so that may go uh, in, in another way. Now, the reason why they are so freaked out, it's not that they are only sadists, even so in the case of some of these politicians, I'm not so sure if that's not an element. But the reason why they are freaked out is not because of the uh, money, uh, <coughs> you know, Greece has to pay back in terms of debt for only 10% of all the so-called bailout packages were ever spent in Greece. 90% went back to the banks, to the German banks, the French, the Italian, the Spanish banks. And that's why this new government says, why should we pay money which Greece never got uh, and they don't want to, to pay? The reason why they are so freaked out is because of the derivative problem. Because Nobody knows exactly how big the derivative exposure is of those banks. And if they would basically cancel uh, this regime, it would not only touch the European banks, it would also probably bring down the American banks as well. Because in this whole bailout procedure, you had a swap agreement between the Federal Reserve and the European banks and when all of this quantitative easing was going on and all this money printing, a very large percentage of that money, maybe half, uh, maybe half, went in reality to the European banks. And these banks are completely entangled, and that is why they are so absolutely freaked out. Now, um, so basically, uh, the uh, so-called um, Rettungspakete, the, the bailout packages, um, which uh, in the case of Greece was uh, in the last five years 246 billion euro, um, you know, so only you know only about uh, 24 billion of that stayed in Greece, and you know that's not that, that's not so much at all. Now the reality is uh, that the transatlantic banking system is completely bankrupt. They all have a derivative exposure of somewhere in the range of two quadrillion dollars. And that is a money which cannot be paid. And, you know, these people are rather willing to go for war and say, we want to maintain our system. And we, especially when we see Asia is rising, China is rising, we rather bring down Russia as a part of the BRICS uh, and destroy this Asian combination than uh, to, to admit that our policies have failed. Now, um, <clears throat> well, if you go back uh, to the period when the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact collapsed, uh, <clears throat> to go into the question of, you know, how did we get to this point? Um, Pope John Paul II at that point said that the world should not conclude from the fact that the Soviet Union had uh, collapsed, that the free market was a superior system. Uh, he said, if anybody wants to know why I'm saying that, look at the condition of the third world, and then you know why this present system is governed by structures of sin. And the recent Pope, Paul, uh, uh, Pope Francis, repeated the same idea in a different way by saying uh, that this is an economic system to which the Fifth Amendment must be applied, that it is a system that kills uh, and that therefore, you know, is, um, you know, a highly, highly uh, problematic uh, proposition. Now, in that period, from 89 to 1990, I, you, you were, uh, <coughs> Dennis was referring to it, we had this idea of an alternative, and I was making many, many speeches saying that if one would now make the mistake, 
and superimpose on the bankrupt communist economy, the equally bankrupt free market economy, that it may be possible for a couple of years to extract huge amounts of profit and wealth by the method of primitive accumulation, you know, by just looting the economies of the former Comic-Con countries, but it would come then to an even bigger collapse uh, sometime soon in the future. And I think that point is absolutely there. Now, unfortunately, people didn't listen to John Paul II because at that point you had in the United States the neocons who were convinced that they had won the Cold War, that the Soviet Union had been defeated, that they did it, and that their system was a superior uh, system. Um, now, in that arrogance, they created something which is, was called the Project of a New American Century Doctrine, which was invented in 97 already, and which was then the basis uh, for, uh, you know, this idea of uh, spreading a world empire, spreading globalization up to the point where no country which would oppose this system uh, basically was allowed uh, to stay in place. Now, um, so at that point, the historic chance which existed at the point of the collapse of the Soviet Union to create a new peace order, because the enemy was no longer there, communism had vanished, uh, that chance was missed. And it was also failed to include Russia into any new uh, agreement. Uh, the contrary happened. All the uh, promises which were given uh, <coughs> basically in the period of the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union in the negotiations between Bush and Gorbachev um, and were given to Kohl and Genscher, um, basically that if Russia would let go Eastern Europe free, uh, not react with tanks or not react with... Uh, violence, uh, then um, basically uh, there was the promise that NATO would not expand to the borders of Russia. Now, that promise obviously has been broken uh, many times and, and frequently and again and again. And <clears throat> uh, at that point, uh, Russia was, you know, you had the uh, turbulent situation, you had Yeltsin, but Russia was uh, not uh, hostile to the idea of an independent Ukraine. And still in 1994, the Budapest Memorandum uh, was uh, giving security assurances. And this so-called Budapest Memorandum was undersigned by the presidents of Ukraine, the Russian Federation, uh, the United States, and Great Britain. And it was signed on the 5th December 1994. What it in, uh, included was the idea that Ukraine, which in the Warsaw Pact had been also a heavily nuclear-armed country, would give up all its ICBMs and totally dismantle all its nuclear weapons and uh, give, uh, receive guarantees uh, in return for its political independence and that uh, none of these weapons would ever be used against Ukraine, except in the case of self-defense, and that the West would also refrain from economic coercion. Now, Victoria Nuland, uh, who presently is one of the uh, people who should be removed from power in the United States if World War III is to, supposed to be avoided, uh, bragged publicly that uh, the State Department spent $5 billion on NGOs in the Ukraine uh, leading up to the colored revolution. And <clears throat> basically that led, as we know, not only to the Orange Revolution in 2004, um, <clears throat> but uh, basically uh, also to the recent uh, developments. Now, uh, it was <clears throat> basically uh, part of this idea to expand NATO to the borders of Russia to change regimes in Eastern Europe who would not be willing to, to submit. Uh, but uh, also, one had to change the narrative. You know, 
this is a very important concept, and I, I already see some people look a little bit worried about what I'm saying, but I know that this is not what you read in the Washington Post and in the New York Times. But the brainwashing which has been done to the American people and to the European people is unbelievable. Putin was demonized and one all of a sudden had the narrative that uh, Putin is a dictator, Putin wants to recreate the Soviet Union, uh, Putin is uh, this and that. Now, just think, 85% of the Russian people support Putin. Now, for a dictator, uh, that's a pretty broad consensus, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> since uh, the rule by consensus is sort of the opposite of dictatorship, uh, it should pose, your, uh, pose in your mind the first question. But if you look at the historical record, the uh, then uh, NATO General Secretary Werner uh, said on the 17th of May 1990 in Brussels, at a NATO meeting, that already the fact that we are ready, uh, that we are ready not to station NATO forces behind the borders of the unified Germany, uh, Federal Republic of Germany, is providing security guarantees to the Soviet Union. Now he was as much the NATO General Secretary then as it was Rasmussen. Uh, until shortly before, and as it is Stoltenberg now. He was not less a NATO general secretary than these people. Now, either NATO general secretaries uh, lie all the time or only half of the time, I don't know. The same thing was also uh, admitted by Horst Telschik, uh, who was together with Kohl in these negotiations around the German unification, and he was the former head of the Munich Security Conference. And the same thing was just again reiterated by the former ambassador Jack Medlock, uh, <clears throat> uh, who spoke for an organization called the Committee for the Republic, which is an American patriotic uh, organization uh, fighting uh, to defend and protect the American Constitution. And he gave a press conference uh, just two days ago, or three days ago, uh, on February 11th in the National Press Club in Washington, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he was instrumental in ending the Cold War uh, at the time, and he blasted the present administration and the Congress for saying that they have an autistic foreign policy, that in the negotiations he was involved with Bush and Gorbachev in 89 and 90. Definite promises were made to Gorbachev uh, there was no written treaty because it was self-assumed you know, that this, what the word was, was valid, so nobody thought it was even necessary to write a formal treaty about it, uh, and that was broken. Now, the narrative <clears throat> uh, is that Russia, since that time, would have refused all offers for cooperation. The truth is, it is 100% the other way around. Russia has made again and again, <clears throat> proposals for cooperation. For example, as Medlock was just saying, Putin, immediately after the attack on uh, September 11, uh, offered help to the uh, United States and eliminated immediately so-called listening posts in Cuba to cool down the situation. He removed vessels from the Kamran Bay uh, and uh, basically, you know, try to cooperate. That same year, 2001, uh, Putin made, as the first Russian president, a speech in front of the German parliament in German. Uh, and he said that he took the courage to speak in the language of Goethe, Schiller, and Kant, and he emphasized the role of the Russian people in making, possible, it, making it possible for the Soviet leadership to decide on a policy which made the peaceful reunification of Germany possible after the fall of the Berlin Wall, without bloodshed and quite uh, uh, easy. And one has to note, you know, I, I want to remember that it was Russia which fought the great patriotic war against the Nazi regime, and they suffered tremendously. And for them to be so generous to say, you know, we allow German unification because the Russian people have a deep feeling of friendship with the German people, 
meant that they had the very laudable uh, difference. They made a difference between Germans and Nazis, and that is not self-evident uh, for everybody, and not, especially not for Hollywood, because my first cultural shock I experienced when I came for the first time to the United States in '73, and I watched some of the movies about World War II, uh, where I thought, you know, what country are they talking about? Uh, anyway, so he, you know, he pointed to this uh, fact, and um, therefore uh, <clears throat> that one has to understand that not only Putin, but all the Russians are extremely uh, disappointed uh, about all of these broken uh, promises. You know, the Soviet Union could have disintegrated violently. You know, it could have it could have led to a total catastrophe. Uh, they could have not allowed German unification. Uh, so then came, a couple of years later, the famous speech by Putin in the Munich Security Conference, uh, which is a, used to be a prestigious uh, conference discussing security matters. Now it's not so prestigious anymore because at the recent conference they invited George Soros and the head of Greenpeace for a panel discussion. Uh, but, you know, Putin made a speech uh, there uh, at this conference, and that should have been a wake-up call for people in the West, because Putin expressed a very uh, deep disappointment about the United States mm -hmm. in particular and their effort to create a unipolar world, and he pointed to the fact, which is another word of going for an empire, uh, and he pointed to the fact that look at the numbers of wars and local conflicts which have increased uh, as a result of that effort. You know, he didn't go into it, but you know, he could have said Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, <clears throat> Afghanistan, Tripoli, Assad, and so forth and so on. Now, the increase in the use of violence in international affairs, ever more conflicts, Elect the lack of power to settle uh, only one of them, the international law which has been violated again and again, and more and more countries feel insecure and as a result acquire weapons of mass destruction, which has created extreme dangers uh, to the world. Uh, so he, at that point in 2007, said, let's rethink together a global security architecture. And he already then pointed to the fact that China, India, Brazil, Russia uh, are all countries uh, growing in importance and therefore a multipolar world uh, would be uh, much more reasonable. And he made several proposals, for example, to create international uh, multinational centers for uranium enrichment, which would be under strict uh, international control and thereby eliminating the danger that countries would try to acquire peaceful nuclear energy and then at the same also have weapon-grade uranium, uh, enriched uranium, and that way you would uh, solve the problem of uh, non-proliferation. Uh, he also uh, demanded a more just system of international cooperation which would give a chance for the development of all countries, something which in the meantime has evolved to become the BRICS. Now, in Germany um, today, if you challenge somebody who has the uh, uh, narrative about uh, that Putin is a, a demon, he is being announced immediately as a Putin Versteher. Uh, that means a Putin understander, somebody who understands Putin. And that is supposed to be the two-by-four uh, argument that if you are accused to be a Putin understander, you are out. You are not being talked about anymore uh, because the official narrative is that Putin is the demon. Uh, and the person has to be silenced instantly. Uh, and basically in Russia on the other side, in the spirit of a patriotic support for Putin, they have now opened a souvenir shop which says Putin Versteher. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they are selling T-shirts which have beautiful different pictures of Putin, uh, Putin with a dog, Putin in uh, some other gear. 
uh, and then they have quotes. They also sang, sell rings uh, with the picture of Putin. And these are being sold uh, tremendously. So I already thought maybe as a polemic against these narratives, we should open up an international chain of such souvenirs. <laughs> Uh, just, you know, to, to uh, I hate it when people are <laughs> stupid and that may help. Um, so, uh, but um, we have to look at this notion of narrative and we should throw it into the garbage can because it is sophistry of the worst kind. Uh, a narrative um, is something which has, or the notion of narrative has been developed by such people like Cass Sunstein, uh, the advisor, one of the advisors of Obama, uh, the author of this book, Nudge. And to nudge uh, is not eating badly with making noises, you know. <laughs> uh, but to nudge means a method by which you, you convince, let's say, a group of people to believe the opposite of what they believed before by nudging them, by by manipulating them until, until you have them where they were, where, where, where you want them to be. And uh, that is also not just in terms of manipulation of, of words, it's also policy. For example, have you heard that the sanctions uh, against Russia are there so that Russia changes its policy? Uh, sanctions in that theory are a policy of nudging. Now, in reality, sanctions are a policy of war uh, that has not only been stated by Lavrov and Putin, but just now by the former Malaysian President Mahathir, that sanctions, which have the aim to change the regime of another country, are <coughs> a form of war. So, uh, <coughs> basically, nudging, nudging the Russian policy until they capitulate to the unipolar world. So this is where we are. I think it is very clear that if we don't go away from that kind of axiomatic behavior and thinking, we will have World War III. And we have to urgently put an alternative to the war on the agenda uh, because war would be the end of mankind in, uh, in any worthwhile form and maybe altogether. Now, there is no legitimate reason why we should put civilization at such a risk because all where this danger comes from is Wall Street, the city of London, and similar institutions, and the people who are playing with that danger. Uh, I mean, I know that in America, the military-industrial complex, the, you know, the, the violence, uh, everything which goes along with this mindset has become all dominant, but if they risk the existence of civilization, how should you call that? Insane? Criminal? I don't think these words are enough. I think we have to invent a new category for the types of people who are risking the civilization's existence. Now, Lynn was referring to it earlier that after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, General Douglas MacArthur already said that from here on, every war will lead to extinction. And now, 70 years later, we are exactly at that point. Now, where is the solution uh, to this? The answer lies in the fact that mankind is the only creative species, at least known so far. I know that there are some scientists right now sending signals out to find some message, others opposing it because they don't know whom we would encounter. But so far, we are the only creative species, unlike the animal kingdom, and we can see the future. At least we can uh, have an idea what the future is like if you continue in a certain direction or in another one. Now, most people think in terms of deduction. That is, that they cannot think the future because they extrapolate their experience of the past and remain practically in, within the system of the present established parameters. Now, the problem we have right now, obviously, is that these parameters are all breaking apart because we are at a point of an international crisis 
where either we all go dead in the thermonuclear war or in, as a minimum uh, die in an uncontrolled collapse into a dark age which then will lead to an uncontrolled uh, use of nuclear weapons in a law lawless state. Now, that world is controlled by the financial oligarchy, and everything is focused around the dance around the golden, golden calf. The golden calf is the monster which must be kept happy, even if it means the sacrifice of millions and billions of human beings. Now, the immediate and only solution to that is the conclusion that the transatlantic system is finished and that a new system is already in the making. Now, it could be resolved fairly easy because the new Greek government is pushing the idea of a European debt conference in the tradition of the uh, London Debt Conference of 1953, uh, where the German debt, which resulted from the time between the two world wars and also the credits of the Marshall Plan, were cut by about 60%. Uh, the total uh, debt was cut from 38.8 billion to 14.5 billion. And that cutting of that debt was what made the German economic miracle possible. Now, when Alexis Tsipras says he does not only want that for Greece, but for all of Europe, it makes total sense because Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, Ireland, they are all in essentially a similar uh, situation. And such an idea to have a European debt conference is being supported by a growing number of economists uh, <clears throat> who basically uh, say that the German insistence and the EZB insistence on the behalf of the British naturally in the city of London, to have this absolute brutal austerity uh, does not make any sense, uh, and that therefore what needs to be done is the opposite. The aim must be to increase the living standard, unlike the Troika who just almost cut it in half, uh, to link the debt payment to 5% of the export surplus uh, to, <clears throat> if there is a deficit, then the debt payment must be interrupted until the growth comes back. There must be an encouragement to replace import uh, through own production domestically, uh, which is totally forbid right now with the global free trade system. And there should be no conditionalities attached like budget cuts and similar things. Now, if there would be such a European debt conference, which may happen either peacefully or con in a, in a turbulent way, then the first step must be a, a separation of the banks according to the Klaas-Steagall law, uh, and then basically commercial banks, savings up to a certain upper limit, state bonds, obligations stemming, stemming from the real economy, uh, where if you would not respect them would cause severe damage, all of that must be put under the protection of the state, while the investment banks uh, have to sort out what is legitimate and what not in terms of their debt. And uh, then, you know, if they can't solve the problem uh, because they no longer get uh, <clears throat> bailout packages or have access to the accounts of the commercial banks, they have to declare insolvency. Now, the second immediate problem which has to be solved then is the problem of the state debt because these states now have incurred large debts because they paid for these bailout packages which went to the banks. And they, therefore, uh, that has to be sorted out and differentiated what is legitimate and what not. But much more important than that is new credit for the modernization of infrastructure in Europe and, by the way, also in the United States because when you run through these highways, you know, I mean, it's almost a human rights violation because you bump up and down uh, like uh, crazy. But there was everywhere in the transatlantic sector a complete negative investment uh, in infrastructure in the last decade. Uh, and roads and bridges are collapsing. Just two days ago in Wiesbaden, the major bridge between Wiesbaden and Mainz collapsed. It just collapsed. 
and there is for 50 kilometers no other bridge where you can cross the Rhine um, and go to the other side. So this creates a, and they say they need five years to build. I mean, this is, we have to get the Chinese to help. Uh, so, um, well, what needs to be done then is uh, a credit system in the tradition of Hamilton. Um, and basically, you know, one can use some of the unpayable debt as capital for a European investment infrastructure bank, which could be called EIIB. And that EIIB could perfectly work together with the Chinese AIIB, the Chinese Uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And then, basically, immediately, you could start producing again. There is no reason why that should lead to any kind of interruption of the economy. Uh, because we have developed already in 2012, when it was clear that these Troika policies would ruin Southern Europe, we wrote a program which we called the Program for the Economic Miracle of Southern Europe, the Mediterranean and Africa, uh, which was consciously an extension of the Eurasian land bridge and which has heavily influenced the Greek election campaign, uh, among other things, because, you know, people, we spread this massively in many languages, including in Greece. So the big question now is, will the euro survive this? Now, probably not. Um, but this euro is an artificial currency Uh, where it would have been better if it would never have been invented because it was the outgrowth of the same project of a, nation, of a new American century ideology uh, which led to this NATO expansion and encirclement of Russia. And at that time, it was uh, for Germany to give up the very stable D-mark for the euro as a price for the unification and to put Germany into the straitjacket of the Maastricht uh, Treaty, uh, which was what imposed all of this austerity uh, regime. And the Eurozone, <clears throat> as we said, before the Euro came into being and before there was any discussion uh, of that, we said the Euro Europe is not an optimal currency zone because you cannot put countries which are completely agrarian like Greece and Portugal and some others, into a currency union with highly industrialized countries like Germany, France, uh, and some of the Nordic uh, countries. So for a certain amount of years, this led to a boom in Greece, in Spain, <coughs> in Italy, uh, but this boom was a bubble. And now we have alone around Madrid one million empty condominiums and tourist uh, places, which, you know, are completely uh, empty now, naturally. So, obviously, in Germany, it led to a stagnation of the domestic market. The euro was not to the benefit of Germany, even if that is said ad nauseam. Uh, the German wages uh, were <clears throat> absolutely uh, stagnant. So, Uh, basically, if these countries would regain control over their sovereign uh, currency, then there is no reason why they cannot join the BRICS and the World Land Bridge. Uh, now, as you see, we have published this uh, report, which goes even beyond the uh, enormous amount of number of projects uh, which the BRICS countries have Uh, con concluded after the summit of the BRICS countries in Fortaleza in Brazil last year, which is enormous. I mean, we have talked about it in the past, but these countries between the BRICS, Latin America, the ASEAN countries, they are involved in an enormous amount of, of projects which people here have no idea about because the mass media are not reporting about it. Now, what we have done with this World Land Bridge report, which, you know, is sort of the extension of our 25-year-old uh, work, because this is what we uh, proposed when the Soviet Union collapsed. We proposed already the connection of European and Asian industrial and population centers through development corridors, and that is what these BRICS countries are now doing, and what we are proposing is to really develop a, a worldwide global infrastructure connection 
so that in a few years you can travel with a maglev train from the south of Chile all the way up to the Bering Strait, uh, down to Mumbai, into Indonesia, or if you like better, to the Cape of Good Horn in South Africa. And that will be faster than if you go by ship. Uh, and that is on the horizon, and that will be not only an economic basis, it will be also the basis for a new peace order. Now, uh, what we have to shift is a new paradigm. We have to leave the area of geopolitics because it is geopolitics which has led the world two times to a world war in the last century. And we have to go to an idea of a win-win cooperation among all nations, as President Xi Jinping has said it many times. For the Americans, it's also an easy concept because what China does today is what was the foreign policy concept of John Quincy Adams, uh, who basically had the idea not that the United States should be a superpower and a you know, world-dominating imperium, but should be a republic in an alliance of perfectly uh, sovereign and equal republics uh, in the world. Now, in order to get that, we absolutely need to have a mass movement for development, and that mass movement is spreading because uh, in the last couple of days, on the 11th, you had uh, in several dozen German and European cities support demonstrations for Greece. Uh, they, are, they have called for a new uh, worldwide demonstrations for tomorrow uh, on the 15th, uh, so I would ask all of you to join that and spread the word. Um, so let's just think, you know, what do we have as a choice in front of us? The negative one, the extinction, I think nobody in their right mind wants, but just imagine where we could be in the world in a very short period from now. If we go in the direction of the world land bridge, in a few months, hunger could be eliminated. In a few further months, you could have safe drinking water for everybody on this planet. You could de declare a war against the desert uh, because with the help of huge amounts of desalinization of ocean water, you could turn all the deserts from the Atlantic coast of Africa all the way to the Sahara, the Sahel Zone, the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East, Iran, all the way to China where you have a gigantic strip of desert that could become uh, lush farmland, gardens, woods. Uh, in a few years, <clears throat> in a few years, poverty, poverty could be completely eliminated and every child could have access to universal education uh, and that would be not just uh, some education but it would go back to the principle of the Humboldt education system, which also determined uh, the education system in the United States in the 19th century, uh, where the goal is not to make money when you are finished, but the goal is uh, to have a beautiful character. And Humboldt defined uh, you know, how to accomplish that. He said there are certain categories of knowledge which are better suited to achieve that goal than others. One is the uh, command of your own language in the most beautiful expression, like the great poets uh, <clears throat> have then universal history that you locate your identity uh, by being thankful to the contribution of the generations before you and enrich, give it to the future generations. It means naturally music, science. It, it means geography. It just means... Uh, the development of all of your talents in the most harmonious way. Now, if the joy of discovery would be in this way encouraged in children, then, you know, you would not have people who stop thinking when they, you know, leave school or even earlier, but <clears throat> you would have basically uh, soon a, a common accepted goal that the aim of education is the beautiful character, or as Schiller calls it, the beautiful soul. Popular, the present popular culture of ugliness, the glorification of violence, 
would be replaced by a love for beauty, a love for classical music. Every child around the globe would learn a bel canto method of singing or classical instruments. Uh, children would replicate the original discoveries of all great in inventions and discoveries of the past. They would <coughs> basically not only know their own culture uh, in depth, but they also would start to know and love other high points of other cultures, of the Chinese culture, the Indian, the Russian, the Arabic, the Persian, the Greek, the Egyptian, and out of the knowledge of these cultures would develop love for the other cultures and nations. The silly lust for the pleasure in the here and now would be replaced by a genuine desire for creativity, the joy of scientific breakthroughs, the discovery of new principles, of new beautiful compositions in classical music. People would love to write poems, write new great dramas, uh, and make also movies with intelligent plots, <laughs> so, something which has not happened since a long time. <clears throat> they would produce uh, documentaries which would make it possible that every child on the globe has access to every universal knowledge uh, there is, and that would change human relations. People would no longer relate to each other like in a soap opera, uh, trying to cheat and stab each other in the, in the back, but they would have human relations like the ones between Schiller, Goethe, Wilhelm von Humboldt, Körner, Einstein, Planck, and if you read the letters among these people, you see how rich people can relate to each other by discussing universal laws in science and in art. Uh, <laughs> but most importantly, uh, this cultural renaissance and aesthetical uh, would be going along with an aesthetical education of men, uh, and that would accompany scientific and technological progress. There would be the recognition that only the moral edu morally educated man is entirely free, because only such a ma mind carries in itself an inner fullness of life that cannot uh, be lost. The feeling for the beautiful must be then combined with the feeling for the sublime uh, because the sublime is that which sets men truly free because if you uh, connect your identity to those values which transcend your own limited mortal life that you become maybe not physically secure but you become morally secure and nothing can defeat you. So this is what elevates us about uh, the power of nature because the sensuous instincts have no influence uh, on reason and our mind is only governed by our own laws of creativity. This beautiful character will be as common uh, for that future society as you have the petty, selfish man today. And he or she will find pleasure in justice, in beneficence, in the fulfillment of all duties which will become like a light play because people will do passionately what is necessary. And they will have a philanthropic heart, an empathy for all of mankind in which uh, all of the talents are developed of all human beings in a harmonious way. The ability to feel the sublime is therefore one of the most glorious predispositions in the nature of man, which both because of its origin from the independent capacity of thinking and of the will deserves our attention, and also because of its influence upon moral man deserves the most perfect development. That is from Schiller from On the Sublime. Now, the sublime must be added to the beautiful in order to make the aesthetical education a complete whole. And only if the sublime is wedded with the beautiful and our receptivity for both has been cultivated in equal measure, uh, are we perfectly citizens of nature without this reason being, uh, without it being slaves and without frittering away our rights as citizens in the intelligible world. 
Now, I want you to think about that because the present condition of mankind is not worthy of man. We have sunk into such a deep, dark age. And, you know, I think we have to go back to the high point of high points of classical culture as it was expressed during the time of the American Revolution by Benjamin Franklin, uh, <coughs> by uh, Lincoln and such people, but also, you know, high points of other cultures to get back to who mankind is. If we want to conquer this and find the identity of man in the future, in space development, in you know, becoming the truly immortal species, it has to be accompanied with these ideas of beauty and the sublime, because only is, if the ed aesthetical education goes along that we can make this necessary shift. And for that, we need a true mass movement for development and also for the development of the soul. <clears throat>